Welcome to IDD, Now You Know Me, a mental health podcast where nothing is off the table. Wait, what does IDD mean? IDD stands for Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. You will hear from us, people with IDD, and experts on topics that are important to us and our mental health. I'm your host, Victor. And I'm Daniel. On this week's episode, we peek behind the curtain of what it's like to be a frontline worker with Corey Earle. Corey is a self-advocate leader and president of People First of Canada. He's a champion for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and enjoys shedding light on the issues people with disabilities are facing. Corey has also been a frontline worker during the pandemic as he works as a screener at a long-term care home. Corey, great to have you here. How are you doing today? Great. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. Uh, And certainly to talk about the important issues that people are facing. So, Corey, tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. So, my name is Corey Old. I am the president of Peel of Canada and also an advocate uh, who strongly believes in inclusion and equality for all people uh, and uh, people of intellectual uh, and developmental disabilities. Um, I also have had the privilege to uh, during this entire pandemic to work in a long-term care facility uh, to see firsthand the struggles um, and what comes with um, what people face every single day. So uh, just trying to make sure that we uh, find solutions, but uh, a champion. Would you rather live in the ocean or on the moon? Probably on the moon. Really? Why is that? Um, Because I think on the moon might be more light versus in the ocean and water. Really? Yeah, I'd, have- I'd agree. I'd agree with that. Uh, I mean, and personally, I'd, I'd also probably live on the moon uh, just because it's isolated and I don't oh, have too cool. many people around. <laughs> yeah. But How about I, you, Victor? If everybody picks the moon, you would, you would have no room on the moon. Well, rather- Victor, what, Victor, what would you pick? I would pick the ocean because, because you could swim in the ocean, you could have nice you could come up for air, just float around, watch the world <laughs> go by, look at the clouds. And if it rains, you can just dive in until the Fair rain enough. stops. Fair enough. Now, um, uh, Corey, it's great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Um, uh, let's get into it. So you work with a lot of people with IDD, and, and you, as you say, you have IDD yourself. Uh, how has the experience of the pandemic been for you and for and for those you know? Um, so it, it has been a struggle. Um, and quite frankly, you know, when we went into this in March, um, even even my depression, my whole struggle just on a daily basis uh, really rise uh, to more limits than at times I knew what to deal with. Um, you know, people around me noticed the big difference in me um certainly at home and stuff like that where i just wasn't coming out um just because i didn't know how to handle it um because on the other hand i I, you know used to stand in there on behalf of someone but uh but at home uh behind closed doors it certainly was a huge struggle for me um and to and to see other people struggle as well has really been an eye-opener you know one thing that's this pandemic that i've seen more and more is the mental health that people have faced uh, each and every day. Um, Quite frankly, the mental health that they've already had um, went beyond because the supports were limited to some that actually got supports. Um, They were limited um, and people that had no support uh, would begin to uh, fall through the cracks even more and more. Uh, So so it was eye opener and it was a really uh, life changing to, you know, uh, even as an advocate, even as someone that experienced the challenges, um, to even try to navigate the system, um, it was more difficult 
um, the prior to the pandemic, uh, because you're able to use to call someone on the phone, and um, certainly this time around, there was a little more challenging, uh, and so many other people faced that. I have a question for you, Corey. How does the challenges differ differ between other populations? Yeah, so I think that I think the challenges with the populations um, is that people with intellectual disabilities and uh, developmental disabilities are truly the left behind of the left behind, and certainly were during this pandemic. Uh, of course. Um, many decades before that, but this whole pandemic has really seen that. I think um, that the challenges compared to the populations is uh, they were they were overlooked at times and where other people got support um, versus someone with an intellectual disability, developmental disability. Um, and I think sometimes people didn't know how to navigate or to try to help that person. Uh, to navigate the system and the challenges that they meet. So there's all kinds of broad ranges on why they uh, faced it more uh, and also the invisible disabilities. Um, you know, how does someone help with that? Someone who has an invisible disability um, who may face uh, a lot more challenging situations. So so um, how, how does all that affect, you know, what, what you do for work? Uh, what it does, it reinforces what we've been saying for years is that we need more support for people. We need people to have support in the community. We need people, we need governments, and it's not just governments, it's society to recognize that uh, people with intellectual development disabilities um, deserve a place in their community, deserve a place in this world, and they deserve to have the same equal opportunity and equal support. Uh, it also reinforces on that we need to move on and get things in place as soon as possible for people. We can no longer deny that this is an issue. We have to accept it and recognize that we must play a role as, as, as a community. So, you know, when you see someone struggling who has no support or many that don't have support or on a waiting list, well, clear the waiting list and get people the support that they need. Um, I, I've often said to people in the last couple of weeks, this is not a choice about we'll wait for years again. This is a choice of um, of someone dying, and that's how severe it's gotten. Um, and I really, really think that the people really need to stop back and think about what does this support this person need, uh, because everyone has different needs, and everyone will have different challenges, and and certainly have. Um, and a lot of that is combined that there is a mental health crisis here. Um, and people need someone to, because not everybody has families, not everybody has the family supports that, that maybe some others do. Um, so we need to make sure we up that support for them. I have a question for Corey. Do, do you find people with special needs are being more discriminated against? Like now versus before the pandemic or do you see like the same thing yeah so great question i think in some aspects yes because i think the fact is is that um is you know this whole issue about people being provided support happened way before the pandemic it's only gotten worse during the pandemic um it increased it because the fact is that people um don't know how to connect and navigate the system now. Um, and so the supports are very limited on that. So I think people then who are in higher levels um, are stuck on how they can support people. Um, and what we said is we gel to people, like there has to be a fine line. Like not everybody has a cell phone, not everybody has a computer. So reach out to people on the ground. And if that means that you have to move into the community to support someone, uh, then so be it. I'd rather have that than someone turn around uh, living on the street who's uh, who has no supports uh, at all. Um, and in terms of discriminating, you know, this is an issue that people have been saying. Like people have been saying that, look, at is it because is it because I have a disability that you don't want to help me? Is it because that I have an intellectual that you find it difficult? 
Um, and, and I think that's unfair if that's the way people are looking at it. I encourage people to get educated and if they're not familiar, like talk to the person. If you talk to the person who has that challenge in disability, um, they will tell you their day to day, but don't just assume and make decisions without consulting people um, and having that conversation because every need, uh, well, will be similar. is certainly different in different aspects. Like Corey, you were saying like you have IDD and it was hard for you to cope with your mental health. How did you like overcome your depression or are you still trying to overcome your depression? How did you deal with the pandemic and how did that affect your mental health and how did that affect your um work health as well so you know and, and thank you it's uh for, for the question this pandemic has no been no question has faced me quite the barriers and, and challenges um you know even two and a half weeks ago um i i i had meltdown and and depression was really high of me um and to the point is where i just said to the uh, people that live there, you know, like, is it worth living anymore? Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, but I, you know, and, and so I, I said, even two and a half weeks ago that whether it's important to live anymore. And I said that because I, I just felt that I wasn't listened to. Uh, and I felt that me going through what I am, the depression, um, it just wasn't worth fighting anymore. Um, and it's the people in the home that really got me up and said, um, this is what you've been doing. Like you, you need to pull yourself in and just really recognize the, on the support, uh, how much people love you and, um, and the difference that if you weren't here. So I had to really pull that, um, aside, um, you know, um, and when I did come to work, you know, a couple colleagues would say, are you okay? Cause you don't look well, or you just look exhausted. Um, and of course being exhausted is because I was up most of the night in tears. Um, you know, there's a few times in the past couple of weeks that, that no one really knows, um, where I cried myself to sleep. And, uh, so, um, so that, that's, so I, I, I say that as an open book person, but I say that as because so many other people, um, face that as well and i just want people to know that there is support out there and and we can navigate and we can get through this um so while it was challenging going to work uh, my colleagues were certainly supportive um of me and it's not something i disclosed to them at all just i just went yeah yeah just been working a lot um but uh yeah uh well thank you so much for being so open uh with us about that i know that that's probably difficult to talk about um and you know i don't think you're i don't think you're alone i mean i've i've had my struggles during the pandemic as well even recently uh so you're not alone on that um what what do you how do you think it affects what do you think it is about um what's going on right now that maybe affects some of us with intellectual disabilities more than others? Um, I think some people are used to having a routine, a used to a structure, um, used to doing things. Uh, and it's, again, I'm not just referring to sports, but used to going out and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, so it affects that way for, uh, for even activity wise about, uh, doing some stuff outside because what's happened is then we're locked down. Well, you know, you have to social distance or you have to, right. Which we recognize. So that plays a challenging role as well. Um, I think, you know, so many, um, of us are used to going to, you know, getting together and, and having a social night, just, you know, even if some friends and stuff like that, and, and that has had an impact. Um, so many people are so used to, um, uh, you know, getting together in different angles, but also some people that do have their supports are used to meeting with their support workers or mean, uh, et cetera. That has had a huge impact because that has been limited now, uh, to phone calls. 
um, in, in some aspects. So there's a variety of ranges and why that's been impacted. Um, and as we, you know, head into the coming months, um, it is going to still be more difficult because I don't think people will be able to navigate the system as 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 quickly as as we would hope. Um, I can know I keep on saying to people, I believe, and I truly do believe that there is better days yet to come. I I, I think if we all try to get through this together, and I know it's really challenging, but try to say that to someone who's hanging by a thread today, though, it's it, it, they people have, people have lost hope on that. They just want to get out. They just want to continue the regular lives that they quote um, have been able to uh, at least enjoy for for this part. Speaking of that, um, you're a frontline worker, and you're also working with people first of Canada, which has always been like a stressful job. How do you like calm yourself down? and try to be happy day by day. How do you not, how do you not give in to depression? How do you like, how do you like um, have that will to like go on? Because I think our listeners would like to hear that if you would like to share. Absolutely, and, and thanks so much for the question. Um, it's uh, so, no question that that being a frontline worker has had its moments uh, and, and been stressful. And uh, um, look, at what I do every day when I wake up every morning, I just I I say to myself, you know what, today's going to be a good day, and today's not going to be about um, what Corey wants. Today's going to be about making a difference, um, and today's going to be truly be about the people that whether it's uh, in a long term care or colleagues across the country about advocating and pushing for the core values and core issues. Um, and when I get into those meetings, um, my job is the first and foremost to represent them. Um, second of all, is going into long-term care. I don't want other people to see because there's people in homes right now that, um, that while they get to see some loved ones, um, they're there every single day. And so my job is when I go in, is if I can provide a smile to them that makes their day, then it's worth accomplishing my day. Um, and if, if, you know, my emotions get high, then, um, then I will leave that um, as I leave my house. And when I come home, um, I, I will either think about happening. And oftentimes I think about how my day is now. Um, and, uh, and, you know, could I have done better? Could I have? But I talk about, um, how important it was um, to really work with a person, especially in a long-term care home. I know, I know you started working in the long-term care home during the pandemic, and uh, I'm just wondering uh, what inspired you to do so. So, you know, I, um, I'm i not one to sit around a whole lot, and, uh, and I turn around and, uh, in, in May, actually, I just celebrated my eight months uh, in long-term care uh, this past Friday. Um, and I said that, uh, to my partner and uh, his mom, I said, I think I'm gonna get into long-term care home. Um, and the response was at the time, there was 53 cases uh, of people who lived there had it and 27, 29 staff that had it. Uh, people were very nervous around the home, uh, certainly my home about whether I should get involved, um, but it wasn't about me at the time. It was about the people in the home that I truly wanted to try to help. Uh, so I contacted. Um, and I really want to, if I could, try to help out and try to make a little bit of difference. Um, and they uh, they called me back right away and said, hey, can you come in for a job interview? Um, I did. I met the executive director. Uh, I was hired on the spot. Um, and I am starting the next day. Um, uh, May 5th uh, is when I started. And I, um, I, I loved every moment of it. I've just, I've been inspired by the fact is that people who live there um, truly have given me hope um, and truly have sent a whole reminder that, you know, look, it, we struggle every single day. Um, and while this pandemic has made it worse, um, this and, and not seeing their loved ones at times as well has been very challenging. Um, they, uh, their smiles and, and just, 
the way of life and talking about uh, what they've done in the past has certainly motivated me. So Excellent. I have Excellent. a question for you, if I may. What do you do for your job? What is your job, Corey? So I actually screen. So um, my job um, is as a screener is making sure that we actually get no cases. Um, so when someone comes to the door, um, I have to ask them a bunch of questions. Um, and um, and if they fail one part of the question, um, then I can't then I can't let them in the building. Um, and why I do call a nurse down to uh, make that decision, um, which they just validate um, for for what we've asked. Um, so they just turn around and uh, and oftentimes the person does have to go home. So um, so we are we are required to send them home. Um, more so, we're able to do that now because of um, the uh, the pen, the way the cases are going on. Um, I'm you know, very happy to say that we actually have no cases at, at the home uh, and no staff off on it. Uh, so so we're, we're, the, we're the first person when you enter the building. We're the first person to ask you the questions. And we also ask you questions when you, we will ask you if you have any symptoms when you leave. So you sign in and then you sign out and your temperature is taken as well. Um, and that is to protect people that live there. It's to protect other staff as well. Um, should you have one symptom, so we are the first. We are the first people um, to ensure that the virus doesn't get into the home as well. So we 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 try every day um, to do that. I, you know, I said the other day that we're just a screener. My boss looked at me and went, "Well, you're more than just a screener," um, and because we also try to make sure the home is protected. What's been your biggest takeaway from being a frontline worker in the pandemic? What have you What have you learned from all this? What What I've learned for What I've learned is that people who have struggled for decades um, have truly shown me that there is hope and that there that, that there is brighter days ahead. I cannot emphasize um, coming into a long term care has certainly changed certainly changed my life. Um, as, as an advocate who I fought for years for people to be inclusive and, and will continue to be. Um, but I've been inspired by the people that live there. I've been inspired by the dedicated staff and management of the place uh, in long-term care here in Carton Place um, because um, they give me hope. They, they truly do. I, I cannot tell you that every single night that I come home now, um, I have a smile on my face because I know that as much as I've made a small difference that um, the struggles that they go through um, uh, are, are just a surreal. So, um, but they're all smiling. The atmosphere is great. People are, are having fun um, despite the pandemic. And so I could not be more proud uh, to, to be there um, and to witness um, that also the, the greatest joy that's also um, at the very beginning of the pandemic when we were allowed to do it is uh, the families coming to see their loved ones. Um, I cannot describe that feeling, just saying that, that feeling, except to say that the connection the loved ones and um, their families have and their friends, uh, it's just, it's, it's surreal and it's unbelievable that, uh, and so as a screener, I've had, to, I had an opportunity to witness that. Um, by being part of those, uh, uh, being being part of those uh, as we screen the loved ones in, uh, as they did outside visits. So, all that to say that uh, that the the lesson here is that there is more work to be done to ensure that uh, uh, that people are part of the community and that uh, that people are are supported uh, and that have the choices and if that means that they're in long term care. Um, and how much choices they have as well. So, um, you know, th the entire long-term care has been very supportive of what I've done here uh, across the country and certainly um, allowed me to be part of it. So um, I originally was only gonna stay on for a couple months, uh, uh, clearly months later, uh, and uh, and I suspect I'll be there for months ahead, but uh, um, it, it's been it's been really an honor of a life to, to work in it because it's something that I never envisioned.
to work in a long-term care in my life. And here we are, pandemic happens and um, I'm here at long-term care. Um, and I'm one just, you know, as people joked um, and said, well, if there's ever an issue, Corey will be the first one to pipe up and, uh, and address it. Um, and, you know, and clearly that's true, but uh, I've not been able, I've not witnessed anything like that, except just caring, compassion from the staff and management. Um, and the people who live there um, on the care that they receive. With all that in mind, uh, what would you like to tell uh, other frontline workers? What, what do you want to tell non-frontline workers about what, what you've experienced? Yeah, what I want to say is that, um, you know, it just people who are not on a frontline worker, if you can, you know, get involved in something like this. It certainly will change your life. Um, and, you know, and what's reported and stuff like that is sometimes not true until you get involved in the long-term care uh, facility. Um, but long-term cares do have their challenges and in and, um, and group homes as well, but um, just get involved, you know, be a community member to support um, and should anything inside happen, you know, report it, but um, really get involved in, in um, because so many people need that um and to the people that are uh on the front line um you know there's not enough uh gratitude and thanks for all the frontline workers that have truly been been part of this and truly have made uh, our world a better place but also um who've given all that they can so um th there's just no thanks for that since uh not enough thanks to go around on that just to say that what you do, we see you, we hear you, uh, and we applaud you. But uh, I'm just so proud of all the frontline workers, but also uh, encourage people that are not the frontline workers who may have different views to, to just get involved. Um, and certainly I'd be more than happy to talk to people. Um, are there challenges across the country on issues? Absolutely. Um, but let's, let's get through it together though. Um, this world needs more kindness than ever now. Do you have any advice for people working in the front lines that are thinking of like quitting and like saying like, this is too much, I've done all I can do. Do you have any advice for those people? Uh, yeah, I, absolutely. You know, I just encourage people, don't give up. Now's not the time to get up. up. Um, reach out, you know, if you need to take a couple of days off just to try to get your, um, your mental health back, absolutely like, take that time off that you need, but, um, but we need you more than ever. We need you on the front lines. I, so many depend on that. Um, you know, and, and so if you're struggling, reach out to someone, reach out to your colleague, reach out to family, member, friend, and just have a conversation because your voices should also be heard as well. But please, please do not give up. Um, our, our country needs you more than ever. We need you, but we also need you there um, that you're gonna be well enough because we don't want to see you go through the cracks as well. So, uh, and reach out to mental health as well. I know that the last eight, uh, 10 months or so have been struggling, I get it, but I, I truly believe there's better days yet to come. So just hang in there um, and uh, and we'll get through this and uh, encourage you to reach out, um, but, but please don't give up. Um, frontline workers have, you've all been essential um, and continue to be an integral part of our communities. Um, and I'll leave it at that. And thanks for coming on our podcast to share your experiences as well. It's been uh, great talking to you today. Thank you so much, uh, both for the questions uh, and, and for your comments as well. Um, and, and to everyone as well, I really appreciate the opportunity today uh, to have a conversation and we'll, we'll continue to uh, uh, navigate uh, through our way of uh, uh, life. And, uh, and, and my heart is certainly with everyone and certainly all those who've passed and, uh, and who are really struggling today. Um, we, we will get through this. Thank you. 
And if that's not a good podcast, I don't know what is. So thank you, Corey, for being for being our guest today, and we'll see you when we see you. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on IDD Now You Know Me. This podcast is brought to you by the Azrieli Adult Neurodevelopmental Center at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, Canada. We would like to thank our producers, Katie Cardiff and Irfan Jiwa, for helping to keep us organized and for all the behind the scenes work that they do.